In the last video, we looked at two different ways of understanding discounting over time. The first way was our classic e to the negative rt. That's called exponential discounting. But I showed an alternative called hyperbolic discounting, which has a different form. And the general form of that formula could be 1 over 1 plus a t. It meets the exact same constraints. A t equal 0, you can see uh, it's, I suppose I should correct this. You can see we can calibrate this so that, oh, why did I do that? We can calibrate this, uh, the t equals 0, it equals 1 over 1, and uh, there's no discounting at all. But it, as t increases into the future, our hyperbolic discount formula will monotonically decline until when t equals infinity, it's 1 over infinity, and it equals 0. Well, the exponential meets the exact same conditions, but they have different shapes. Now, remember, I used the analogy of radioactive decay to show how the exponential discount rate is time invariant. That is, looking forward, the next time, looking forward at a constant period of time, this period delta t, the next point at which we're going to evaluate the discount factor is always the same relative to the last point. Uh, if delta t is the half-life, then we're always, every delta t, we're cutting the exponential factor by 50%. But this is not true of the hyperbolic discount formula, because the hyperbolic discounts more in the near term and less in the long term. As a matter of fact, I compared the integrals and said, the area under this is infinite, whereas the area under this curve is, for all discount rates greater than zero, finite. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, we know the basis for the exponential discount formula is the opportunity cost of alternative investments. Turns out, we don't have the same basis for the hyperbolic. You say, well, what? On what basis should I choose the hyperbolic if I have a perfectly good discount function with this basis of opportunity cost? And the answer for choosing the hyperbolic comes from human and animal behavior. When we study human and animal behavior in non-financial settings, we find that humans and animals typically make choices with regard to time that are much more like the hyperbolic model than they are the exponential model. And I'll give you an example. Suppose that here at time equals zero, we're very tired, we're ready for bed, and we need to set our alarm. Why do we need to set our alarm? Because uh, we have a test coming up. Uh, this is the next morning at this time, and then this is the time of the exam. And when we're getting ready for bed, we say, you know what, I'm going to set my alarm early I'm going to make a sacrifice at this time. So we're going to represent the sacrifice as going down on the cash flow diagram. I'm going to make this, get up early. I'm going to make the sacrifice of getting up early. I'm going to study for the test, and then that's going to pay off later in terms of a better grade. There's our payoff. Now, when we're looking at these decisions from this point in time, which is when we're going to bed, we say, well, what's the sacrifice that I have, I'm imagining that I'm going to make in the future? Okay, I discount that sacrifice because I'm not, it's not tomorrow morning yet. I say, aha, that discount factor, 50% or 0.5. I say, the payoff for the exam, well, that discount factor, 0.25. And I say, hmm, the exam payoff is so big that here when I am thinking about setting my alarm, the exam payoff is so big, I'm willing to make this sacrifice. Let's say the exam payoff is five, and the alarm uh, sacrifice might be one. So when we are doing the net present value of this diagram, it's not a cash flow diagram, and it's more like a, some abstract utility diagram, the inconvenience of waking up early and the payoff of the better grade. We say, well, here's um, the inconvenience of waking up early, that's one times 0 0.5, 1, 5. We want to know the net present value. We say, well, we're going to multiply by this factor. We 0 0.5 times 1. That's negative because it's inconvenient. But the payoff of the exam is going to be 0 0.25 times 5. 
And what's the net present value of setting your alarm? Well, here's the 0.5. Oh, and that's 1.25. So uh, if I've done my math right, you are going to set the alarm so that you wake up early because this has a positive net present value for you. Now let's take a look at this hyperbolically. Here we are at time zero, and here's your alarm clock. Now we say, well, what's the inconvenience of waking up in the morning? Oh, it's in the hyperbolic compared to exponential. It's less. Let's call that, say, point. And then we say, and what is the convenient, I mean, what's the payoff here in the exam? We say, oh, well, you know what? Uh, it's very close to the intersection point. So we can say that both the hyperbolic and the exponential are about 0.25. Now let's run it a little bit differently. Here's our inconvenience, 0.3. One, we said, was the inconvenience of having to wake up early. But the discount factor has changed. This is exponential. This is hyperbolic. The discount factor has changed to 0.3. Plus... Ooh, same discount factor because they're identical at this point in time. So if we use hyperbolic discounting, we say, well, here's 1.25 minus point. Ooh, we definitely want to set that alarm. We'll even set it for 15 minutes earlier. This is us the night before an exam, and we say with hyperbolic discounting, we're like, oh, terrific. Now let's fast forward in time. Here it is in the morning. So this is a new sort of time equals zero because we've slept the night. The alarm is going off. We have to ask ourselves, here's the inconvenience of waking up at our new time equal to zero. So now because this is time equal to zero, the exponential would say one. And we have to start a new hyperbolic, of course, as well. Uh, the hyperbolic would also be one. And we know from the time invariance of the exponential discount factor that the new payoff on the exam is 0.5. So this equation no longer holds. We have new discount factors. And we have to say, okay, now what would the equations be? Well, one, here's the inconvenience of getting up early, say 0.5, times the payoff, well, this person, certainly they would wake up. Look at this, 0.5 times 5. If they were an exponential discounter, sorry, that's negative because it's inconvenient, 2.5 minus 1. We have a positive value here of 1.5. It makes sense that it's gone up, remember, because these now uh, this exam payoff is getting closer. So the, the decision that you make in the morning for the exponential discounter is... Wake up. Bright and early, you're ready to go. Let's take a look at the hyperbolic. Now, the hyperbolic, we're in the morning, that's the present, so the inconvenience is the exact same. But remember, with the hyperbolic, this comes down a lot steeper than the exponential, and it only crosses later on. So this is our new hyperbolic function, now, with our new time equals zero, and we say, well, what is that? It could be, again, from this uh, shape, uh, I suppose, it's uh, 0.3. Now, this is going to make my example look a little silly, because the utility here is 0 0.5. And I could have chosen these numbers a little bit differently. I suppose I could have chose uh, something like 0.2 where we see that this would come out negative, that it's just a different shape of a hyperbolic. However, we've all had the experience of waking up in the morning and the alarm that we set the night before now is a nuisance instead of an aid. We hit the snooze button and despite the fact that the payoff for getting up early hasn't changed, our understanding of it in time has changed. And because we don't discount exponentially. We discount hyperbolically. Let me, uh, for the sake of argument, uh, change this to something else. We say, look, there's no payoff to waking up early at all anymore. It looked like there would be a payoff the night before, but when we use hyperbolic time preference, there's no payoff at all. And the answer here might be sleep in. That's what I mean when I say the basis for hyperbolic discounting is human behavior. The alarm clock study and dozens of other studies show that people and animals 
when they're heuristically working through problems, they behave like this. They discount more than exponential would predict in the near term and less than exponential would predict in the long term. What does that mean for the environment and sustainability? What that says is, if you have a problem that doesn't show up until the very long-term future, and this could be, I mean, very is a relative term. It could be climate change. It could be other problems. It could be species extinction. It doesn't seem like a problem now, but down the road, perhaps it is. And we use exponential discounting which is appropriate for financial analysis, the exponential discounting would say, don't worry about it. We'll worry about it when we get there. The hyperbolic discounting would say something very different. The hyperbolic discount might say, it's worth making sacrifices that we can imagine in the near term. Let's say this is 10 to 20 years in order to reap benefits that happen in the very long term, let's say that's 100 to 200 years. If we apply a financial discount function to a non-financial problem, we may get perverse results. That is, results that we are not happy with based upon the way we actually relate to time. Now, all that's interesting, but I'm going to show you one more thing. The fact is that in society there are a lot of different discount rates and that means there are a lot of different discount factor formulas. Here's a very steep discount rate, well, you know, for the sake of argument we'll call this 20%. And here's a very shallow one, and for the sake of argument we'll call that 1%. But of course there are other people in our society that have even steeper discount rates and there are even people that have no discount rate. Uh, or a negative discount rate or a near zero discount rate. All of these discount rates are represented in society. These are all exponential. What I'm saying is that R, when we uh, talk about people's time preferences and when we talk about financial instruments, we talk about borrowing rates, there's no one single R. There are many different R's. There is no way to choose an average discount rate to create an average discount factor formula that still conforms to this exponential discounting. We can't take 0.2 and 0.01, average those out, and say, well, let's try 0.105 and get this shape of the function in the middle. We can't do it. However, if we did do it, if we did, that is, it doesn't conform to E to the negative RT anymore, but if we did add up all of these different discount rates, all of the different possibilities, and we did average them all out, we would get a function. It just wouldn't have this exponential decay formula. As it turns out, the shape that it would have is hyperbolic. Thanks for listening.